where lust for a whole life and nothing but less makes people jump out of a comfortable pond into an unknown ocean. Welcome to that journey between the East and the West. Who says Rolling Stones don't get a moss? Hello everyone, I am Meenu Gupta, your host for the day, and I'm delighted to have you join me every week as amazing people share their incredible and inspiring life stories of straddling continents. Thank you. Diplomacy, politics, environment, and peace. Where and how do they all come together between the East and the West in one person? Dear listeners, our guest for today, Eric Solheim, is a well-known global leader on environment and development, as well as an experienced peace negotiator. A man of many hats, he served as Norwegian Minister of Environment and International Development from 2005 to 2012 and led the peace efforts in Sri Lanka from 1999 till 2009, while also having played a vital role in peace processes in Nepal, Myanmar, and Sudan. Eric was also the executive director of UN Environment Programme from 2016 to 2018. Currently, he is a vice president of the Belt and Road Green Development Coalition in Beijing and the vice chair of Europe Asia Centre in Brussels, as well as being on the advisory boards and chair of multiple organizations across Asia, Middle East, and Europe. Thank you, Eric, for joining me today. Thank you so much, Minu. It's my, it's my pleasure to be with you. I'm looking forward to an exciting conversation, I hope. So amongst the many other sectors, how did diplomacy, politics, environment, and peace come to be a part of your life's journey? You chose them or they chose you? Do share with us on how it all began. I guess it's a mixture of the two. Of course, at a young age, I took a lot of interest in politics and global politics. We we were very inspired to try to do something for the poorer parts of the world, realizing that growing up in Norway was a privilege and people were not as rich or happy in, say, Africa or South Asia and other parts of the world. So we wanted to do something. That was also at the time of the Vietnam War. We protested this horrible war which killed two to three million people for absolutely no purpose. It's one of the very few wars in history where the result was exactly the same after killing three million people as it would have been without any war. So from a young age, I took an interest in uh, global issues and then coming into parliament and politics uh, in Norway. I try to keep that, even if politics everywhere is local. You don't really get votes and no longer engaged in the global issues. It's mainly about how to provide better health care or better schools or better roads for Norwegians. You played a significant role in the peace processes in s- several countries. What would be your definition of peace and a peace process? I have a kind of narrow definition of peace, if not complete happiness and complete avoidance of any kind of violence, because uh, no society will reach uh, nirvana or the paradise, there will always be conflicts, and uh, in every society there will be sorts of violence and suppression. So, but just the avoidance of organized violence and war is an enormous uh, success. Only people who are living in complete peace don't understand how important that, that, that is. I mean, now you're living in Hamburg, but let's assume in your neighborhood, you know that a few kilometers from your from your place there is an armed gang which will come and rape your daughter, uh, kill your husband, destroy your shop, whatever it happens. It's the all-consuming thing of life because it decides whatever you can do and cannot do. So bringing peace is a basic for everything in every society. Only based on peace you can develop economically, on the best on peace, you can protect the environment better. So we, we should admit that just bringing peace is incredibly important. 
even if it doesn't lead to a complete solution of all issues. How and why were you called upon in Sri Lanka in 1999 to mediate? That was partly because Norway had worked very hard on peace process in Middle East, in Guatemala, and a few other places. So Norway was a nation which was called upon uh, to provide peace. And then the Tamil Tigers, the, the rebel movement in Sri Lanka, they came to my office and asked, can Norway play a role in bringing peace in Sri Lanka between the Tamil Tigers and the government? And then started with this very modest background. In the beginning, it was very secret. In Sri Lanka itself, only the president and the foreign minister was aware of what was happening and it was the leadership of the Tamil Tigers. But we got started from the Norwegian side and then both the government of Sri Lanka Komilatunga and Tamil Tigers and the Mr. Prabhakaran decided that Norway should be the third party trying to bring peace to Sri Lanka. When people and countries in different parts of the world ask you to step in to mediate for peace, don't they feel that since you don't know their culture, values, traditions, then how will you really understand them and mediate on their behalf? That, that, that's a brilliant question because, because we came from a very different part of the world. In the beginning, we also knew very little about Sri Lanka. I have to admit, I had been there once before I was asked to become the peace negotiator. So our understanding of Sri Lankan affairs was limited. However, that's of course also exactly why they wanted us, because they didn't want a major power like the United States of America or India, because they had a lot of interest in Sri Lanka. And they didn't wa- they couldn't find some local person or, or, or institution which was acceptable to both sides. The sheer fact that Norway is far away from Sri Lanka and has no economic or political interest in Sri Lanka, except trying to do good for the world and, and bring peace, that was exactly why we were selected. And of course, Sri Lanka has one big influential neighbor, which is India. And without Indian support, we knew we could do nothing. And India would also only accept a small, far away nation as the peace negotiator in what they consider their backyard. They would never accept to bring in, say, China or Japan or not even European powers like France or the United Kingdom was acceptable to India, only a small nation which could also not do harm. But it's a very, very fair question to ask. We understand sufficiently a very different culture. Thank you for sharing it so well. That means that Norway essentially did not pose a threat, but had the possibility of taking an objective stance. How did you, however, go about understanding the different cultures of these countries before you stepped in to mediate? The most important, I think, for all conflict resolution is to understand that we have two ears and one mouth. That was a hint from God Almighty that we should listen more than we speak. And we listen and listen. We listen for tens of hours, I think for hundreds of hours. Particularly, I listened a lot to Anton Balasenga, who was then the chief negotiator and political advisor of the Tamil Tigers. I listened to all his grievances on behalf of the Tamil people, all his complaints about the government, his version of the history, basically going back to the times of the Buddha, so the, his version of uh, Sri Lankan history for 2,500 years. But of course, then I also listened to Singhalese voices with the same same uh, coverage, and their views were very different. So listening, trying to understand what are the core issues which we need to resolve, and what is the culture context where they understand this. Of course, Sri Lanka is a country of at least four religions. Buddhism is the most important. Secondly, Hinduism, then Islam. And there's also a small group of, of Christians in Sri Lanka. While the Sri Lankan conflict was not about religion, still having some understanding of religious context is also very important. But only listening, trying to understand, being curious, I think that is very important, not just for peacemaking, but for everything. If you want to understand India or China, or say if you live in India, want to understand Germany or France, I mean, please be curious. Please try to understand and learn. Please write books about the country. Please listen to radio, podcasts. I mean, now, of course, there's any number of information on the internet. That was not the case 
at that time. So if you're not curious, if you don't listen, you will come nowhere. When you look back at the processes in Sudan, Sri Lanka, and Nepal, is there any similarity in conflicts that you can pinpoint? There are huge commonalities, but of course there is no peacemaking on the cheap. If you want to provide peace, say, between Russia or Ukraine or between the Palestinians and the Israelis, you need to understand that specific conflict and you need to understand the history and the culture of these countries. So it's not like you can just learn conflict resolution and run around the world without without trying to understand the culture culture context. However, there are obvious similarities. I mean, point to one, there is no conflict resolution without compromise. And that, frankly, doesn't apply just to nations. I mean, try to run your family without compromise. Uh, the father decides everything, what we'll have to din- for food for dinner tonight, what cinema we will watch on TV, uh, what soccer match we will watch, uh, what we'll do in the next holiday. I mean, we, this kind of, without compromise, a family cannot work, nor can a sports club or a nation or international affairs work. And in conflicts, you will always find people who take pride in not finding compromises. Sri Lanka, many people come to my head, oh, oh, I was so clever yesterday. I met for a meeting and I gave no concessions. But if you don't give anything, the other side will not give anything either. It must be compromise. And we should uplift this wonderful world of compromise. It's a wonderful world. I mean, say, look, the Palestinian Israeli conflict is now, people are seeing it as a win lose conflict. Either the Palestinians or the Israelis are winning. But it's a lose-lose conflict at the moment. No one is winning. Both communities are losing because there is no safety or security for the Israelis and Jews, nor for the Arabs and Palestinians. With compromise, say a two-state solution in the Middle East, it could be security for both communities and a much happier and, and better Middle East. That was the same in Sri Lanka, but everywhere else in Sudan, wherever I was involved, please look for the compromise and please uplift and speak nicely about the idea of compromise. Very nicely put, actually, because the word compromise is generally looked upon as a very negative word. What you are right now saying is that it is part of the whole peacemaking process. Am I right? Absolutely. But look, the, everyone deep down really understand that if you are married and you don't make any compromise with your partner, can it work? You will normally be divorced very soon. There must be compromise in life. That also applies in these in very intricable conflicts. Uh, we must look for the compromise, the solution, which can give something to both sides. And normally that will never be 100%. Uh, you get just something. Uh, and I look for people in history who really made compromises. They may go, maybe they got 60% of what they wanted or 70% of what they wanted, but not 100%. And then they brought society uh, forward. I mean, a brilliant example is the first Irish leader, Michael Collins. He fought a fantastic uh, guerrilla movement against the Brits, killed a lot of the Brits. He was enormously successful as a military leader. But he understood that he couldn't bring down the British Empire by a small group of dedicated people in Ireland. So at some point he understood, uh, let's make a compromise. And he got, I think, 70% of what he wanted. By the way, over the next 100 years, Ireland got everything it wanted, basically. So that was much better than continue the fight uh, and trying to reach 100%, which you normally in life cannot. Unless you can wipe out the other side which of course normally means genocide or mass mass murder, you will never solve a conflict without compromise. But the question then arises, compromise on what? Moving on from there, was, was there a generality in the peace processes of the countries where you were involved? I think every, every conflict um, is separate, but let me point to a successful conflict resolution, which I was part of, and that was the conflict in Nepal. The Maoists, of course, had a lot of grievances because of the unfairness of the system in Nepal, which was an, an enormous divide between rich and poor, between high caste and, and low caste. And the Maoists started a guerrilla, guerrilla war 
We play that role in trying to bring the Maoist and the mainstream parties together. At the end, the Maoist accepted to come back to politics. And since then, there are three uh, prime ministers of Nepal has been from the Maoist party. The current prime minister, Mr. Prashanda, is also from the Maoist party. So the Maoist became a very significant part of politics and accepted to give up the weapons. But the other parties also accepted to bring them in. Of course, there's been no real accounting for all those who died in the war, because if you want to bring those to court, it will be very difficult in the midst of the peace process. And Nepal is still not really developing fast. I mean, if you compare to the two big neighbors, India and China, they are developing much, much faster than Nepal. So it's not that everything is resolved in Nepal, but at least this peace, on the basis of peace, the people of Nepal can find lasting solution to their problems in the future. So it's a good, successful story of a compromise which benefited both parties to the conflict. And as you said, also the egos of the leaders, because they could also be part of the political solution. And of course, at the end of the day, most important, they benefit to the wonderful people of Nepal. Eric, you are part of the Belt and Road Coalition. What is your viewpoint about it, since it is an essential matter of the East and the West. And how did your involvement in this happen? As I see it, Belt and Road is by far the most important uh, investment initiative in our time. Uh, China is uh, now the main trade partner with the vast majority of nations in the world. Something like 120 nations have China as their number one trade partner. Nearly every nation in Africa trades more with China than with any other nation, even in South America, which is so much the backyard historically of the United States. Big nations like Brazil, for instance, trade a lot more with China than uh, with, with the United States. So China is indispensable for economic development, but more and more China is also the lead nation on everything green. China is 60% or more now of solar, wind, hydropower, electric batteries, electric cars, electric buses, electric trains, whatever you want to mention in the green sector, China is close to total dominant. Look, there's no way you can start a solar industry anywhere in the world except you pay a lot more without China, uh, because China and Chinese companies are producing something like 95% of all, all solar panels in the world. So this makes um, Belt and Road so important and, and of course so important that it's now going green because that will provide for green investments basically everywhere in the world. Uh, yes, India is not part of Belt and Road. Some Western countries are complaining because they don't like China to be successful, but we can live with that. As Belt and Road expands in scope, so do concerns that it is a form of economic imperialism. Some worry that expanded Chinese commercial presence around the world will eventually lead to expanded military presence. Last year, China also established its first overseas military base in Djibouti. What is your opinion? Yeah, I basically think that uh, highlights how unfair this coverage in the West is. It's true, China has one base outside China in Djibouti. The United States of America has about 800 bases outside the United States in the rest of the world. So if that's a problem to the world, what's the problem The one Chinese base or the 800 American base? By the way, many of them very, very, very close to China. Look, if China has started building military bases in the Caribbean or just outside San Francisco, uh, there would have been such an outcry in the United States. It would be um, unbelievable. So this is simply that best of the 200 years of unprecedented dominance of the world, through colonialism first and later through American dominance, they cannot accept that there is a peer nation which is as powerful as the West, and that is China. And we should measure China with the same measurement we should put to ourselves. Look, um, we all in Germany, where you are sitting, or in Norway, where I'm living, we all are very, very grateful for the United States because of the so-called martial help after the Second World War, which helped our economies to grow. The Chinese motivations between behind Belt and Road is exactly the same as the American motivation of martial help. Number one, you want to help other nations which are not as successful and as happy as yourself. 
Secondly, you understand that it benefits your own business to have this help because if it's a bigger global market, you will sell more. Americans benefited in the 1950s and China's benefiting now. And of course, both the Americans and the Chinese won't have a, a good name of themselves because a good name also gives more influence. So let's judge China with the same mirror or the same standard as we judge ourselves. And then we come to the conclusion that this scheme is largely for good. And then, of course, we can start criticizing specific actions which we don't like. Herbert Wiesner, the General Secretary of Germany's Penn Center, PN Center, says human rights are being left in the ditches by the sides of the new Silk Road. I mean, that's what he's referring to, the Belt and Road Coalition. So what is what do you think? Look, I mean, of course, if we speak specifically of China, nearly all human rights in China has improved dramatically in the last, econ- last years because of the economic development. People have much better health. Life expectancy in China just passed life expectancy in the United States, which, of course, is a major achievement. People have better education. They have better food. They have better life in basically every aspect. But they do not have the exact same rights to vote in political uh, campaigns or the, or the issues concerning minorities in China, like the Uyghurs. On these matters, we need to have a dialogue with China. But the big difference between China and the US or China and the West is the following. China has no idea whatsoever of exporting its political system to others. You understand that the Chinese Confucian political system, it's thousands, maybe 3,000 years old, at least 2,500 years old, and it cannot be uh, an export article to, to anyone else. We, on our side, we believe that our political system is the best for everyone, and we should basically implement that everywhere in the world. It has been an enormous failure wherever we have tried to do that by military means, like in Iraq or Afghanistan or uh, Vietnam or every other place where we try to do it militarily. But it has largely <laughs> been a failure also, then they are all, always on the try to do this by political and economic means. So on this area, they are not really involving in the domestic politics or others. China is far superior to the West. However, in one area, China should also learn from the West, and that is China is a, now has a very strong nationalistic tendency. Uh, it's a nation with a lot of pride and honor. And whenever someone is criticizing China, they tend to uh, react very, 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 very strongly. Look, if anyone is dis- criticizing the United States of America, uh, the local American ambassador couldn't care less. He will never write a report to President Biden because Americans are completely, completely calm for criticism. That's so used to. If someone, even a small politician in a small country, is criticizing China, they will be up in arms because they see it as a slide to their honor and pride. So, let the West learn from China in not having opinions on places in the world where they know nothing, not interfering in the domestic politics of every other nation. But let the Chinese learn from the West in allowing the shoulders to come down. Uh, there is no danger in allowing some criticism. And basically, also China can, can do more to find compromises, say, with India, with the Philippines, Vietnam, area nations where China has no military conflict, but still they have. They have different views. In all your globe trotting years, Eric, which country has had the maximum impact upon you? Oh, it's a very, very hard question, but uh, I'm very much drawn to the great Asian cultures, which basically mean China and India, because look, before 1800, these two cultures were by far the dominant in the world. I mean, they were the most developed nations, the biggest armies, the biggest em- strongest emperors, the most advanced culture, most people were literate. Uh, there was no comparison whatsoever. When Marco Polo, the young European, went to China in the 1200s, no one thought his stories were, were true when he came back. He was called Il Milione, meaning that he was exaggerating a thousand times because no one could believe his stories from China, because China was so far ahead of Europe at the time. The biggest city of China those days, Hangzhou and Kaifeng, they had maybe one between one and two million people, while Paris, the biggest city in Europe, was 75,000. So China was so far ahead. So I'm drawn to these very, very strong cultures uh, of China and India. They're very different. China is the least religious place in the world. 
uh, nothing to do with the present government. India, however, is the most religious place in the world. Uh, so they're very, 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 very different. But uh, they have very, very strong, long, long-lasting, incredibly exciting cultures. And by the way, also, also great food. And why do you think that India is one of the most elitist countries in the world? I didn't think of it like that. As I can see, Prime Minister Modi is basically right that the religion of Hinduism has been the, uh, the core character of the Indian nation through thousands of years. If you go to Hindu temples today, I mean, they're so vibrant. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people being there every night. Look, this, this, is from a, this one is from a city called Ujjain in Madhya Pradesh. It's a temple there. There are 200,000 people visiting that temple every day in the weekdays, 100,000 on, on workdays. I mean, Christian leaders in Europe can, can only be absolutely jealous. Most churches in Europe are empty, except maybe for Christmas and, and Easter. While the vibrancy of Hinduism it has been more vibrant after Prime Minister Modi came to power, but it's an enormous, enormous force. And so many Indians tell me, I, I want to do this or that for my nation. They, I have never heard any European say, oh, I want to do this or that for France or for Norway. Uh, so it's uh, at the moment, there's an enormous pride in India, maybe on border to being a bit arrogant sometimes. Uh, but, the, <laughs> but people feel that the moment of India has come, the 7% economic growth, we will double the economy every 10 years. We will surpass the American economy in a, in a few few decades, and you see new infrastructure coming up, and Hinduism is revitalized as a kind of the strong strong ideology of India. I, am of course, aware that there are issues here, particularly in the how to relate to the 200 million Muslims also living in India. But after all. I see this revitalization of Hinduism and economic growth in India as an enormous strength. We should benefit in that, but at the end of the world. And why do you think that the churches are empty? I tend to believe it's because this revitalization of Hinduism and the upsurge of nationalism go very strong together. Look, I mean, after the modernist, after the dominance of the West, every big developing country was facing the same issue. How can we modernize without westernize? We want, because if you don't bring in modern technology, you are doomed. You can never make people affluent. You can never develop your country. You need railways and you need cars and you need computers in modern times. So you need to modernize. But you want to modernize, but you don't want to be a copy of the United States or Europe. You want to promote your own history and heritage. First nation that cracked that code was Japan in the 1870s. I mean, in three decades, they moved from a very, very poor and backward nation to beating the Russians in a war and became a very developed uh, country, but it's still absolutely Japanese. I mean, no one will go to Tokyo and think that this is America. No, this is Japan. Korea now, K-pop, K-movies are all over the place. K-pop is even, they're even king in Korean language. I mean, every Norwegian pop group will start singing in English if they want a global audience. They sing in Korean, very small language, just understood by Korea itself. China is a lot more Confucian, and Prime Minister Modi is making India very strong, fast developing, but going back to the roots of Hinduism as, as the kind of core values uh, of India. What was your image of India? before you visited? And did that change over time? Because you've gone back there again and again. You have so many projects running. Do share. That would be very interesting to know. And when was the first time you actually visited? That was a long time ago. I won't even admit it because it uh, shows how old I am. But it, it was in 1984, right, right after Indira Gandhi had been murdered and when there were some pogroms about Sikhs in, uh, in New Delhi. So it, but at that time, India was such a horribly poor place. It's unbelievable. You, a Western like me, even if I was a backpacker, there were hundreds of beggars trying to get something from me, and I felt very uncomfortable visiting India in those days. It's a huge difference now. Uh, as uh, Norwegian ambassador just told me, I mean, a few days ago, Years ago, no one wanted to go to India because they were afraid of getting stomach diseases and, and food problems. 
Now people don't want to go to India because of the pollution. So the perspective has uh, completely, completely changed. But I, I was scared of the poverty, but because over time I've seen how India has developed. It's a much richer, much happier place. Uh, and if we can double the economy in the next 10 years and then double again, because India will very soon also be a upper middle income country. You have obviously seen India go from there to there to new heights. The British, when they left, actually, India was left in shambles. Since then, India has risen pretty almost from the ashes, so to say. So you have actually seen the rise of India. Absolutely. And of course, it's absolutely horrendous that still you meet people in the United Kingdom who tell them, oh, colonialism was a good thing. You taught the Brit, you taught the Indians how to run railways. We provided education to them. This is completely nonsense. Colonialism meant the primate major death of maybe hundreds of millions. Some historians now say that more people died early due to colonialism than all those killed in the uh, Second World War. But for sure, the fact is that when, when the Brits left in that in 1948, life expectancy was about 28. Uh, the amount of people who could read and write was maybe about 15%. Well, now life expectancy is soon passing 70, and nearly all Indian boys and girls are starting in school, even if quality needs for sure to be uh, improved. So from 28 years of life expectancy when the Brits left to close to 70% now, it's such a leap. So forget the idea that colonialism was anything but an enormous crime uh, to humanity. And India has done very well um, after colonialism. True, China has increased its economy more than India, but also India, from any any historical comparison, has done well, and I'm sure it will do even better in the years to come. How do Western media and Western intellectuals view India? In my mind, there is always a danger of a single story. Because that story becomes the story or the image that people then all over the world believe. Absolutely. I mean, you are are so right. I mean, look, population of India is like Europe, North America and South America combined. It's an enormous land. And of course, basically everything which exists under the sun exists in India. So people should be curious on India. Look to the variety. There is uh, 20 l- languages in India, which is bigger than my language, Nor- Norwegian. Most of them have even separate alphabets and separate, separate scripture. If you move from one village to the other in India, they, they tend to be Hindus, but they believe in different gods and they, they do the, the religion in different ways. Food is very different. So it's an enormous, varied place, and people should simply go there with curiosity. Of course, Indians come to Europe should also be curious. I mean, most Indians will not be able to tell the difference between Germany and France, but let's invite them and, and uh, tell tell our stories. But if we go there, we should be curious on this enormous, fantastic nation. And we should look to the many areas where Indians are ahead of us, not just find something to criticize them. So many Western intellectuals tend to criticize the one story which has been dominating Western media, which I think is basically wrong, is that Prime Minister Modi is a right-wing politician, which is making conflicts between Hindus and Muslims. That's a basic story which is dominating Western media. Well, Prime Minister Modi leads a party which historically was a small party for upper-income intellectual traders in the cities, mainly male. But now, Prime Minister Modi's party, BJP, is the totally dominant party among the scheduled caste, very bottom of society, and the backward caste all over northern India. And they're following basically a, what has been considered a lefting economic policy, meaning using the state to drive economic growth in the market and distributing more fairly the outcome of the economy. So it's an enormous success story. It would be like, say, the Conservative Party of the United Kingdom becoming the party of the cho- of choice for the poor people of the United Kingdom, uh, which is uh, they are still very far, very far from that. So BJP, the lead uh, ruling party in that, in any consideration, is the most successful party in the world, much more successful than anyone in Europe, 
or in, in the in the Americas. They have the most su- successful social media operation of any and the um, party, and they've been able to rebrand themselves as a party for the masses, while originally it was a very narrowly super intellectual high caste party for for basically big cities of India. Very interesting. I see that you're quite well entrenched in Asia, particularly China and India. You seem to understand them quite well. I hope so, and there is so much to be impressed by in India. Look, last time I was when I was in India three weeks back, I met with Gautam Adani. Tom is now the richest or second richest person in India, one of the 20 richest in the world. But then he told me his life story. I mean, he did grow up with a family of eight children in one room in the city of Ahmedabad. They didn't have electricity, so if you wanted to read, he had to go outside at night to read under the street lamps. And when he was 14, he left home to do some trading. And when he was a young man, he was running around the city on, on a scooter. On well, that basis, it created the company, which is not so important for the solar and wind transformation of India. They are now establishing what will be the biggest solar and wind plant in the world, in the desert of the state of Gujarat. That wind and solar plant will produce as much energy as, as whole hydropower in my nation, Norway. And we are very well served, 100% for hydropower with a very high standard of living in a very cold country. So to meet that man coming from basically absolute nothing, the most modest of background, into becoming a lead business person is so inspiring. But of course, of course, mirror the life story of Prime Minister Modi himself. His parents were running three or four tables at a small rail station in a small town in India, which not even Indians have ever heard of. And on that basis, coming from a backward caste and relative poverty, it did rise to become the President Xi Jinping and President Biden of the US, the most important leader in our time. That's not small achievement. I saw a picture of you recently from the Ram Temple. Were you there on the consecration? I was there the day after because I felt that at that day there would be such a crazy I couldn't, wouldn't be able to see the temple. <laughs> so I was there the day after and it was very, very a privilege that the World Hindu Council gave me a, a round tour, tower, round tour of, the, of the temple the day after. It's absolutely wonderful, beautiful art, uh, sand inscriptions and cravings in, in sandstone, a uh, lot of art, and of course it would be a, the pride of all Hindus for for maybe hundreds of years to come. Uh, um, a major tourist attraction, uplifting a town which is still relatively poor Ayodhya. Indians are so proud of it. And remarkably, the opening also went without any kind of counter manifestation from Muslims and others who may feel disappointed with the, with the temple. So it has been accepted. Fantastic. That was a wonderful opportunity. Absolutely. It, it, I mean, I can recommend everyone to go there. It's such a beautiful, beautiful place. Mm-hmm. And uh, it symbolizes, it will be also the kind of symbol of the new ri- rising in India, combining modernity and, uh, and uh, more affluence with uh, the heritage of these many thousand years old culture. Eric, in your journey of life, you have seen immense diversity in the people you interact with and negotiate with in different parts of the globe. Therefore, by now, you would be having your own lived definition of diversity. What would that be? I think the, the most important word is the word respect. We need to respect uh, each other. I mean, there is no way we will get one political system in the world or one preferred religion in the world. Uh, not even the taste of food or, or what kind of nature we like can be the same. So we need to respect each other and, of course, benefit from the variety because a society where there is more variety, where we can inspire each other, will be at the the end strong. And let's avoid those people who say that, oh, I'm right, I'm right in everything. Those very daily contribute to others. Look for those who are curious, try to learn, try to understand. But, I mean, if you are a Christian, of course, you can be very curious on Hinduism without converting to Hinduism. And if you're a Hindu, you can try to learn more about Islam. All that is possible in a, in a more 
by Stanford. Eric, there's an interesting term going around these days, global citizen. Do you think that you are one? Look, we will never get anything like a recognized global citizenship. I mean, because we can all respect each other. But people at the end of the day are communal and tribal. And I think that, that that's that's in our genes. Look, if uh, there were an earthquake in your house, or a big fire, we will all start by saving our, our own children. Then next we will save our husband or wife. Then our parents or cousins and relatives and friends. And then later will come all the others. And at the end we come people from very different backgrounds from the rest of the world. I mean, if people don't have that instinct, they cannot survive because that's imprint- imprinted in us from the time we were running around in the forest and living in caves. You need to protect your own first. So there's nothing wrong with that. But on that basis, you can reach out to try to understand others. So, and of course, there's a huge difference between China and India in the sen- and Europe in the sense that all Chinese are Chinese first. All Indians are Indian first, and then there are Gujaratis or Tamils or speaking Mayalam from Kerala, whatever. While in Europe, uh, we are very far from that. No, very few people in Europe are European first. We are French first, Spanish first, German first, Norwegian first. Uh, so I think uh, in my and your lifetime, and maybe even much longer, we will still be tribal in Europe. So let's find this combination of accepting that we live localized life and need to take care of our neighbors and friends and family first with the view that we are much better served in the world if we work together and if we are curious on other civilizations. Eric, what is the message that you would like to leave the audience from your learnings in life? You've had a journey and you've been involved in some of the most significant processes in the East as well as in the West. And you have entrenched yourself in a part of the world that you were not born in. I find that actually quite amazing. So do share what message you would like to leave behind. I think at the end of the day, the most important of all messages is very simple and it basically exists in all cultures, but in the Western culture, and Jesus Christ said it very well, what you want others to do to you, uh, you should do to them. If we live by that, uh, the world will be a much happier place. Wonderful. By the way, I actually live by that because when I keep that as a base, words and actions just stem from that base. Eric, thank you so much for joining us today and do continue doing what you are doing now. Thank you and namaste. Thank you so much, man. It has been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for listening to the series Between the East and the West. Do subscribe to the channels mentioned on the site in case, of course, you liked what you had. I am Meenu Gupta, the host of the series, and I'll be looking forward to your comments. We love feedback. Thank you once again. Namaste and bye-bye.